from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome back to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and I am the host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. And as always, I want to give a special thanks to my patrons, Kaizen, two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, David, John, and my girl Judy. You guys are muchly appreciated. Thank you. So this podcast will be the second part in the Cleveland Torso Murderer series. If you haven't heard part one, you will want to go back and listen to that one so that you have the information that I'm about to expand upon in this episode. So in the first episode, we discussed the time in history when the murders took place, how many people had been struggling through the Great Depression as well as the Dust Bowl. A great many people were out of work and would sometimes fight for day labor jobs. This is the nature of the beast for that time. Now due to this, little shanty towns would pop up. And it was in one of these areas, in an area known as Kingsbury Run in Cleveland, Ohio, that decapitated and dismembered corpses began showing up. Now we went over each known victim, as in how they were found, most often in severed pieces. And we also discussed a possible psychological profile of the murderer. So now let's discuss suspects, suspicious deaths, and the infamous Elliot Ness, and even whether or not the murderer didn't disappear, but rather uprooted and moved on. So let's touch on Elliot Ness for a moment. He was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1903, being the youngest of five children to Norwegian immigrant parents who worked in a bakery. So after high school, he went on to college and earned a degree in political science as well as business administration and was a member of the Sigma Alpha Epsilon. His sister's husband was a member of what we now know as the FBI and he persuaded Elliot to get into law enforcement. So in 1926, the now 23-year-old Elliot was already working with the U.S. Treasury Department and was a formidable force in the Bureau of Prohibition in Chicago. So in 1930, it was decided by the government that it was time to capture Al Capone, aka Scarface, who was a mobster and businessman during the Prohibition era. He was a very well-known crime boss. So now Al was being investigated for tax evasion and conspiracy to violate the National Prohibition Act, and Elliot was specifically chosen to lead a small squad of investigators. At this point, he was only 27 years old. Now Elliot, finding out just how very corrupt the Chicago's law enforcement was at that time, had difficulties finding honest men. But he was able to, and the group he put together would be known as, quote, the Untouchables. Within six months, he and his agents had taken down bootleg liquor operations worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in that time. And in all, it would cost Al Capone around nine million dollars. Wiretapping was the most common and effective tool, and it was well known that Elliot could not be bought or paid off. All of this led to Al Capone being indicted on several violations. So we know that after this, he was transferred to Cleveland, Ohio, and was put in charge of both the police 
and the fire departments. His reform programs were very aggressive and ultimately successful. He all but completely eliminated or fired corrupt cops and held others to extremely high standards. Elliot declared war on the mob and focused on very big crime families, which I'm sure was quite dangerous. It was during this time that Elliot was also peripherally involved in the case of the Cleveland Torso murders. So his methods for trying to not only ensure the safety of the people living in these shanty towns, but also catch the murderer were not met with happiness or applause. In fact, there was public outcry of his presumed treatment of these homeless people. He gathered up most of the people from the tent village where most of the murders were happening to get fingerprints and question them and had the fire department first search these tents and then burn the structures down. While the public went into a rage, the murders suddenly stopped. So even though he didn't really catch anyone red-handed, as they say, his raid and the questioning did stop the serial killer, at least in Cleveland. So moving on to the suspects. The previous coroner of that area invited all local authorities, detectives, and so on, as well as anatomists from the Western Reserve Medical School and even the heads of area psychiatric institutions. Together, they all decided that the murderer most likely was a hunter, a butcher, a medical intern, or even a full doctor, though no one really wanted to believe that. Now, according to these experts, the cuts were too precise to be inflicted by anyone with no prior knowledge of anatomy. So Elliot Ness did have a suspect in mind and secretly brought that man in for questioning as well as a lie detector test. This man was Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. Now this suspect could not really be made public at the time because a relative of Sweeney's was a congressman. And really, the good doctor's family was quite prominent in the area. Francis, born in 1894, married and had two sons by the time he became a certified doctor in 1929. He served in World War I as a medic and performed countless amputations on the field, but was discharged with a notation that he was, quote, 25% disabled, unquote. He was most certainly an alcoholic, and when he drank, he became violent, erratic, and would disappear completely for sometimes days at a time. And then he was discharged from practicing medicine after his wife, who was a nurse, had him committed for treatment for alcoholism in 1933. He divorced her in 1936. So in March of 1938, a dog quite literally walked into someone's home carrying a severed human leg in its mouth. This was fairly close to where Sweeney was living at the time. Then later that year, he was examined by two court-ordered psychiatrists and found to be quite sane. And yet in August of that same year, he committed himself to a veteran's hospital. But before he had himself committed, and he was ultimately diagnosed with schizophrenia, he was holed up in a hotel room with Elliot Ness, a psychiatrist and the head of the Scientific Investigation Bureau. It took three days for Sweeney to come out of his drunken stupor and subsequent hangover to be remotely coherent, and it was said that he, quote, lurched across the room complained of burning sensations and shouted against imaginary pursuers." Unquote. Sweeney was interrogated for eight hours a day for a full week. He was given a lie detector test a few times. Dr. Leonard Keeler, who invented the lie detector test, administered the test and said that Dr. Sweeney was their man, that there was no question about it. 
But unfortunately, Elliot was forced to let Sweeney go because the evidence they had against him was just circumstantial. And from there, the good doctor disappeared into the Veterans Administration's hospital system. Elliot continued to receive postcards and letters over the years from the doctor, but they were mostly incoherent ramblings. Another suspect in the case was a man named Frank Dolezal. Now, Frank was born in 1887 in Slovakia and immigrated to the United States. He worked as a bricklayer, which is, of course, honest work. And Frank had once lived with Florence, which was one of the verified, identified victims of the Cleveland Torso murderer. Another victim had a habit of hanging out in the same tavern that Frank often went to, and it is important to mention that he, too, was an alcoholic. Also, Frank had been acquaintances with two other victims. Frank was described as a strange man who owned an impressive amount of butcher knives. There were rumors that he talked aggressively to himself, so he was the only man officially arrested as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Road. He was 52 years old when they took him in and harshly interrogated him for two days. He subsequently confessed to the killings, but according to the Cleveland Police Museum, his confession turned out to be a wild blend of incoherent ramblings mixed with oddly specific details. It was pretty obvious that he had been coached. He was found hanging in his jail cell just before his trial, and it is widely accepted that he did not commit suicide, and his autopsy showed six broken ribs to which anyone that knew him stated he did not have before he was taken into police custody. Most likely, the authorities were just getting desperate and used Frank as a patsy. There are some theories that more than one person committed these crimes, but the theories don't pan out to anything substantial. But there is one theory out there that is, while a bit of a stretch, it can't entirely be discounted. You see, Murder Fam, that suspect is none other than Dr. Steve Hodell. I did a podcast on him a while back, and I'll put a link in the notes below. So when the Cleveland Torso murderer was active, Dr. Hodell was 25 years old. I bring him up because he's also linked to yet another very grisly murder, the Black Dahlia. Now remember the letter Elliot Ness received not long after the murder stopped? It had said, quote, You can rest easy now. I have come out to sunny California for the winter, unquote. The writer went on to confess to performing medical experiments upon guinea pig victims in Los Angeles. He went on to say, quote, I felt bad operating on those people, but science must advance, unquote. The Black Dahlia would be murdered nine years after the last confirmed victim of the Cleveland Torso murder. Now, both the Cleveland murders and the Dahlia murder were so similar to each other that it is hard to dismiss. The Cleveland murderer took care to bleed the victims dry, and they were known to be groomed and cleaned post-mortem. Elizabeth Short had also been drained completely of her blood and cleaned so thoroughly with water and a bristle brush that brush fibers were actually found embedded into her skin. It is believed that a butcher knife was used to dismember the Cleveland victims as well as Miss Short, who had been bisected so skillfully that it is believed that only a truly gifted butcher or surgeon would know the precise location of where to cut through her abdomen and vertebrae so perfectly. And let's not forget that Elizabeth, as well as the Cleveland victims, were cut while still alive, and she too suffered from genital mutilation. The Cleveland murder victims had been displayed or otherwise posed, as was Elizabeth Short. There are too many similarities to just shrug it off. 
I'm not saying these killings were done by the same man. I'm simply saying it's plausible. Now, one might wonder how Dr. Sweeney could get out of a mental institution once he was committed, but one cannot forget that he voluntarily committed himself, so he was then free to legally walk right back out. And many people believe that he did just that. Dr. Sweeney and Dr. Hodel, it was mentioned in sources, had some similar physical features, but are most definitely not the same man. So we are left with the question, was Dr. Hodel in Cleveland at the time of the murders? Now this is a fan favorite theory actually, though it is hard to pin him down in Ohio during the murders. Dr. Hodel received his medical degree in 1936 from the University of California, San Francisco. The typical year that is accepted that the Cleveland Torso murderer struck was 1935, but the Lady of the Lake was in 1934. He would have been in medical school during this time. We know that George had a child with one of his professor's wives, and the scandal was such that she moved, quote, out east. He apparently followed her out there because he wanted to be with her and the baby, but she ultimately rejected him. Now, could Dr. Hodel have been in Ohio during the murders, perhaps going through to visit his child, or, or maybe the child was living there? It's not out of the realm of possibility, but it is definitely a stretch. He could have been on winter or summer break from school when the torso killings occurred, but it's rather unlikely. Again, he was busy building his medical practice and rubbing elbows with the elite of Los Angeles in California at that time. There are other murders that have been linked to the Cleveland Torso murder, such as the 1945 through 1946 lipstick murders in Chicago. And Dr. Hodel's son, who worked for the police in Los Angeles, favors his father in a few other murders, including the Zodiac, though George would have been in his 60s when they started. So in all, people like to think that America had their own version of Jack the Ripper, who killed in Ohio, Illinois, and in California, and possibly elsewhere. That this man was the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States. It's an interesting and fun idea to entertain for sure. And perhaps the Cleveland torso murderer struck elsewhere, but I am not inclined to believe that Dr. Hodel was the murderer. It's pretty well accepted that Dr. Sweeney was the killer, but for now and for the foreseeable future, we just don't know. So then ultimately what became of our main characters? Elliot Ness's popularity and fame fizzled out rather quickly. He was married and divorced a few times and was criticized for his social drinking habits and was involved in a scandal where he had been drinking and driving and was involved in an accident and there were no fatalities, but he tried desperately to cover it up and he was found out. He eventually moved to Washington, D.C. and fought against the practice of sex workers around military bases. He ran for mayor in Cleveland, but he did not win. His drinking got worse and worse, and he ultimately died from a heart attack in 1957 at just 54 years old. All I could find about Dr. Sweeney was that he died in 1964 in a mental institution. So guys, what do you think? What are your theories and ideas about the Cleveland Torso murderer? Could it be Dr. Hodel? Was it Sweeney? Was the murderer the one that also killed Elizabeth Short? So many questions. So tell me your thoughts and theories in the comments below in the video, or you can leave me a DM on Instagram at serial underscore killing, and you can always email me at serialkillinginstagram at gmail.com. And as always, thank you so, so much for listening. I appreciate every single one of you because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Thank you so much and have a great day.